couple years ago, Matt came up with a geographic information system model that correctly predicted the location of alpine villages. This idea to do this spawned simultaneously with myself and another graduate student who was working here at High Rise at the time um, named Oren Koenig. A few years before that, Rich had discovered a site that just seemed really reminiscent of one of these alpine villages, but because we hadn't officially discovered an alpine village here in the winds. We weren't sure if that's exactly what it was. And so as soon as we could, we went up and looked. We went up there and actually did determine that it was a very similar village to what we have here at High Rise. But more interesting was that it was located on an identical topographical, geographical and ecological spot. In other words, it was basically at the same site, but five miles to the south of us. And also around that time we started, we found one more village nearby. And once again, the same exact thing. And these attributes that kind of connect all these sites, where they're all located at a particular elevation right above tree line between 10 and a half and 11 and a half thousand feet. They're in areas of high solar radiation, meaning they get a lot of sun. And they're all on slopes, anywhere between 10 all the way up to 30%. So the bunny slopes all the way up to a double black ski run. They were all identical. It really just seemed too much to be, to be a coincidence. These three major villages we found all had 20 plus lodge pads, but in the midst of doing some exploring and surveying, we found numerous other features, some little clusters of lodge pads, two or three, maybe one by itself. And once again, all of those were exactly the same location. And so where I did my undergraduate degree at Davidson College, um, there was a professor there who did work in Central America using GIS, or Geographic Information Systems which is basically a, a computerized way of displaying lots of spatial information. Um, Google Earth, for example, or Google Maps, for example, is a good end product of what a GIS product or project can do. We wanted to see if there is, actually I wanted to see if there is a pattern associated with these, with these topographic environments and these variables that we were noticing being similar between all these villages. So in essence, I created a computer program that took all of these, um, all of these attributes, the elevation, the the exposure to sunlight, the slope, and looked at where in the Wind River range these all existed in one location. And we assumed that if this pattern that we predicted would be correct, then that there should theoretically be more alpine villages, um, alpine villages located in these areas. So we, in essence, we created a big map that had little red spots all over it. And those red spots represented the highest likely locations that we thought based on this model, um, new villages should be. And that next summer, with a little help from Davidson College and the Explorers Club, we launched two trips to see if it worked. And we found 15, um, 15 new village type sites. And by village type sites, I mean anything from one lodge by itself to some, some pretty big ones, 10 or more. And they worked with the model and that every single one of these once again fell into an area that that predictive model said that they should be. And so at that point, we realized there really is a pattern with these sites here in the winds. And they're all, they're kind of a spattering of age ranges, some going back to early, late prehistoric, um, some more historic with metal artifacts in them. But it really seems to show that these village locations were chosen very intentionally and very specifically. And after doing some more playing around with the variables, um, these, these ecological niches that these villages are located in are actually it seems to be chosen specifically for the highest producing whitebark pine um, areas. And not only the highest producing whitebark pine stands in the winds, but these village sites are located within the most producing parts of the still living forests. So not only were they specifically choosing pine forests to live in, but they were locating the areas within those forests that produced the most nuts at one time. And there's definitely still some more work that needs to be done on this, but um, this seems to show at least with pretty good confidence right now that these villages were, were chosen and the sites were chosen for very particular reasons um, around whitebark pine nut harvesting. Even in places where there are currently no whitebark pines growing, there are still some village sites, but there are evidence, there is evidence in the form of ghost forests that there used to be whitebark pine uh, stands right there. And that's really a fascinating thing because we've got a, a paleoecological indicator that shows the tree line for whitebark pines has dropped about 300 feet in the past 800 years or so. And, you know, incontrovertible evidence that A, prehistoric Native Americans were harvesting whitebark pines, and B, whitebark pine stands have dropped in elevation at least 300 feet, maybe, maybe more in the past 800 years. Matt's uh, program really 
did a great service by actually quantifying uh, the parameters and identifying the one key one, that being, I think, white barks. There's actually a lot of data that existed from people who were studying um, bighorn sheep and also elk migrations up here in the winds. And I tried to look at, at proximity to that. And, and what I found was that a lot of them are in close proximity to that, but I think it was less, um, it was less intentional and more so that at tree line and big open meadows in the winds where these white bark pine forests happen to grow, you're going to find a lot of big animals anyways. Um, I do think that they were definitely intentionally hunting bighorn sheep up here, but I think probably during the late prehistoric period, there was no lack of them. And so it was less of, it was more just being up here and less of specifically choosing a location because they were just everywhere. You know, what we're finding is that, that uh, most of the villages are not that far from the lowlands, from a potential winter camp. They're only about a long day's walk, which makes sense because if you're gonna, if you're gonna transport all those white bark pine nuts to your winter camp, you don't wanna have to tote them for three or four days because then it, it's not that much of a great trade-off in terms of energy efficiency. And we're talking, for the most part, pre-horse people. Here we are at High Rise, and it's basically a three-hour walk to a place where you could spend the winter. I think that was a draw, too. But uh, it will be interesting as we go farther deeper into the winds, which we're going to do later this summer, to see if, if the, the pattern still holds. It seems to. Where you find big, dense stands of white barks, you will, I expect you will find villages. Here, this is a monoculture. There, at this altitude, there's nothing but white bark pines.